Hey guys, what's happening? Dustin Dolby here. Hope you're having a lovely day. Welcome back to Workflow. Today I'm running through my workflow for approaching liquor glass photography on a simple piece of acrylic and just building up a bit of atmosphere around our glass, mainly just using light, which is fun. It's an affordable way to shoot and it produces a pretty cool look. Here's an image I shot, I think three years ago. I posted this in a forum and people have reached out and asked me to post the lighting setup. So I thought I'd run you through a similar workflow today and start to build up this kind of masculine, classy, sultry look to this glassware shot. We're kind of looking at an upward angle, which creates a towering effect. And using an entry level camera is no barrier because we're actually using a kit lens as well. And zoomed out to 18 millimeters, it'll kind of, even on a crop sensor body, begin to complement that towering effect. So leave me a comment below, let me know what you want me to shoot next time. Any questions about this, I'll make sure to get back to you. And let's just dive right in here. I love photographing glassware. And if you can pick out a glass with a nice feature to it, like the bottom of this glass is very thick and beautiful, it's gonna play nicely in the light. So definitely spend some time and shop around for a cool glass. Because when a simple speed light's shining through the back of the glass, it looks quite magical and it evokes uh, deep emotions. Is it just me? Leave me a comment below. So with our shot set up like this and the camera's pretty close to the glass, I'm just gonna take a shot without the settings even dialed in. Because at f4 in daylight, I mean, this is what you'd be looking at. And I may have the camera set up like that if I'm adjusting the composition in the LCD screen. But once I've locked that in, you can see the highlights are rather unruly here. So we wanna simplify this down to a black frame and get rid of all this ambient data just using our settings. So the way I'll do that is stop down my camera to f11. And the shutter speed can be 1 200th, which is the max sync speed for my personal Young Nuo flashes. A lot of them are around there but pretty much that just lets me get the darkest settings I can get working with the flash. I could go to F22, but F11 will suffice, and this looks like a nice, crisp, dark frame. If you're struggling to get clean highlights in your own work, make sure to implement this in your own workflow, because if you're just letting the ambient light affect everything, it's sabotaging you a little bit. When you make a frame black, you just ensure that the kind of arbitrary highlights in the bright frame aren't going to leak into your image at any level. And it, black frame or seemingly black frame can actually have a lot of dark gray in it. So feel free to bring up levels if you want to ensure you get a clean slate. You don't have to obsess over it, but just get a nice dark frame and I promise you it'll make your shots a lot cleaner. Okay, so let's bring out our first light here. It's gonna be a Yongnuo 563. And we're just gonna aim this right behind our glass, just at the white wall behind us. We have a big white wall. So that serves as a great thing to shoot a light against. If you don't have a white wall, you can always use a diffuser as your background. Instead of bouncing off the diffuser, just shoot through it as your background. So I'm going to turn this on. It's our transmitter. It'll talk to the speed light. And that's all linked below as well. And I was taking a shot in the dark here, literally. You see me just had a black frame. So let's see what this is going to look like. Think in your head what this will look like. Just, we had a black frame. Now we're shooting a speed light with a grid off a white wall. Beautiful. So a nice radial glow and pretty centered. I mean, it's off-centered at the bottom, but it doesn't look ovalish, so I don't actually mind the way it looks in terms of being centered. You see the bottom of the glass is playing with the light in a very nice way. That's always fun, and that's why it's important to pick out nice glassware. Now, we're using a three-in-one grid made by Rogue on our speed light, and I like using these. When I first started product photography, I may have just shot with a bare speed light out of necessity and moved it really close to the wall to create a burst, or maybe I'd make a DIY solution or a snoot, I have really grown to appreciate, I will say, the effect of a grid. And people didn't used to go with speed lights because there was no modification, but that's not the case anymore. There's a lot of modification. So you see, it gives us quite a radial glow to our light. If you were shooting with a broader, bare speed light, you could create a vignette in Photoshop or blur the edges and sort of fake it till you make it in this department. But it is nice to capture soft radial light right in camera and just sort of adjust it as you go. But instead of going for a classic, you know, circle behind the product look, I'm gonna tilt our speed light down just one notch, one degree. And then hopefully that'll help the light kind of peek out over the horizon. And I like that, that creates some atmosphere. Also, it's brighter in the middle of the glass than beside the glass. And that's because it's reflecting light from beneath. See how bright it is beneath? So that's beautiful. There's some contrast there and it draws your eye to the drink, specifically the bottom and the contents of the drink, which I think is nice. Now, I'm not naive. I know we're not going to get an ultra-wide look with an 18 millimeter kit lens on the entry-level body, but we do have it to some degree. It's more obvious maybe even in our brighter shots. And this wouldn't be the same if we were to, say, theoretically back up our camera a few feet and then zoom it in 
and frame up a similar shot, you get a much different spatial compression. And it's important to keep in mind, this isn't caused by zooming in or our close shot being zoomed out. A far away shot could still be zoomed out and you could crop it in manually and you still get that spatial compression. It's really caused by the proximity of the camera to the subject. So we brought our camera in nice and snug, but not too close within its minimum focusing distance, which is unique for each lens model. And you know, shooting with a wider angle is a little forgiving when it comes to focusing, but a quick trick is just use a pen. You can put that in your whiskey glass and then that gives you something you can grab onto in the middle and actually focus on. All right, cool. So I'm gonna bring in one of these diffusion discs now and these guys don't get enough love for how nice they are. They're very versatile and they're not just for product photography. So I'm gonna bring this in right next to our product. And by keeping it static here with a clamp, we'll leave it very manageable and we'll be able to really flatter our highlight, even with a cheaper diffusion material like these, which I think are like $5. Okay, that's not the prettiest highlight, but we're off to a start. It's quite foggy. It's kind of like a, a diffused highlight when we shot it through a diffuser, but I would like to convey that this glass is glossy to some extent. And it's not the smoothest highlight. You can see the shape of the strip box in there, which is usually a no-no. And we are using the eight by 36 inch strip box, which does have a speed light in the back. So I just brought that in. And it's the same model of speed light, the YN 560 Mark III. And again, like I said, there's more and more mods available for speed lights and strip box and strip box adapters are a huge one. That's an amazing thing to have. So I'm gonna bring in a second one of these and that will be more like Savage Translucent Plastic, which is a thicker diffusion material and just get us a smoother highlight. We'll do a little comparison once I get these stable. And I'm just on one quarter power with my strip box, which hopefully can have the juice to get through there. Nice, and did you see that update? It's a pretty severe distinction, even though it's a little foggy still and I want to improve it, at least it's getting smoother now and we're kind of seeing a left to right gradient and less of a chunky uh, stair step. Now, if you look at the left part of this whiskey glass, there's a pretty big gap, like a four millimeter gap between the highlight and the edge. I'd like to define the edge a little more, not completely, but just get it a little closer to that. So I'm gonna adjust my strip box a little bit. And we can try a few different positions. Like if I brought it out in the middle, it wouldn't be very flattering. It would be a little foggier. If I bring it more towards the back, I can get a really sharp gradient by pushing my diffusion material against the edge of the strip box, the lip of the strip box. That creates a hard edge and that'll hopefully reflect in our glass and also it'll convey glossiness to the subject. And by subject, I mean viewer. Nice, and that's a little bit of an improvement already. Down here on the right, we see there's a reverse reflection coming through there and that's beautiful. That's another reason I made just for just move my light around a bit. Just like the middle of the bottom of the glass, I wanna have a few different options maybe and it's quite arbitrary how these little distances massively affect the size of those little highlights. So I like to pepper a few options in there personally. So looking at the whole scheme, I like the gradient. It's very sharply bright on the left-hand side, which I enjoy. It falls off pretty quick, but one thing that I think we could improve on is getting a bit of a harder edge to that gradient. The lip improved a little bit, but if you wanna go to town and get a really sharp edge, use a black piece of card. I just got this from the art store. And what we can do is bring this in on the interior of our diffuser and just completely block the light, leaving a completely hard edge. And that'll have classy, classy ramifications. Like look for example how harsh that highlight is there on that left side compared to the other ones which were quite foggy. That's a beautiful distinction. A matte glass couldn't reflect like that, but a glossy one could. So you're conveying the you know, material finish to the viewer, but you're also making it look sharp and very classy. I like that. I think we're you know, getting to a good point here. Okay, let's add a little bit of fake ice to the mix. This will spice things up. It's low grade ice, but if you're an artist and fake ice maker, get at me, I'll feature your work. I won't overthink where I'm gonna place these. In fact, why don't I just drop them to begin with and we'll just adjust them around a little bit. Uh, this front cube's a little nasty. Oh cool, that's not a horrible look. Like they kind of look like they're melting a little. I do like that. And we could reduce the brightness in the middle of the cubes just to make them a little less daunting. But I do like how they're like little, you know, cubic prisms and they're just distorting the backlight even more. 
All right, we're popping bottles. We're popping real bottles when I hit 100K, but right now we're popping a chalice full of water. Just gonna get a feel for the two second remote here and just throw this in here and see what it looks like. Okay, it's like 1% cool, but that's a womp womp right there. I think the original was a lot better and that original was our first splash too. Just took a, took a chance in the morning before work and it worked out. But that's the way she goes. And we also have a dedicated course on splash photography. If you wanna learn more about how to get more consistent and frame things nicely, we focus on that a bit more in our Martini episode, so check that out. So I'm gonna grab these frames. I might keep splashing a bit. We'll either retouch a splash version, an ice version, or just a liquor version. Either one's fine <laughs> in post production, and I'll meet you there. All right, people, here we are inside of Photoshop. I grabbed a frame I like, and there's a gradient occurring in this image, so part of my typical workflow would be to go to mode and 16 bit per channel, which will just give me more depth and help prevent a chunky gradient, which is banding, I think is the real term. So filter, noise, and add noise. I'm adding this to a duplicated layer, which I also do in conjunction with that. Even a few points of a percent of monochromatic noise, just to add some grit in there and give it something to grip onto that isn't, you know, a stair-stepping, chunky gradient. So it'll get us off to a good start, and we might add a little bit more noise in a minute. So I'm going to start with a crop, and I thought about how I might want to crop this today. I think I'll crop it like our original image. And I'm going to put the horizon on this bottom third line, which isn't something I always do, but it's a nice sort of divine ratio, if that's the right term. Leave me a comment. Let me know. I'll go 3% tighter. And I like using the directional pad to position it up and down. And something like that looks nice. Why don't I start with the marquee tool, just grabbing the right side of this image to the right of the glass. I'll hit control T and just drag it out with this right node enough to fix the fact that that's curved, which is subtle enough that it's not gonna throw off our symmetry, I don't think. And you could do the same for the bottom. It would look really cheesy though, it'd look quite distorted. In this case, I'm gonna do something different I often do, which is try to grab the darkest color. So I hit I and I'm grabbing a dark color down here and I hit G to bring up my gradient tool on a new layer at the top here, linear gradient and foreground to transparent. I'm gonna fade that in because you can create a false bottom as long as your, you know, you, your low point is where that reflection actually goes to. And you can do a short one, but as long as you go up to the middle here, anywhere in there, you can start to create a false bottom and it looks more natural in some places compared to others. But if the corner of your image is giving you problems and has different colors in it, you can use the eyedropper tool with caps lock on, which kind of averages out colors. And then you can add that with a brush. I hit B to bring up a brush and at a low flow, I can paint other colors in there really subtly from the sides of the image. Our horizon's actually just looking straight as an absolute arrow right now. But with the distortion flavor to this whole image, why don't we actually just reintroduce that? So I'm gonna go to lens correction and I can easily just sort of, you know, bow it in one way or the other, uh, not that way, the other way. So. Maybe I'll just take a few points off and you could go crazy with this, but then that'll just make the background a little bit more fish eyed in a nice way and kind of suit the flavor of the image since it's like a, such a central kind of heroic framed image. Cool. So why don't we go in here with the patch tool just by hitting J and I like the patch tool and I'll just start cleaning up the more uh, nasty elements of this image. And I just realized caps lock being on was, making the tool behave funny because I had caps lock on a minute ago. You can hold shift and grab a ton of things and you can use the spot uh, eraser tool for this too. That'd be pretty easy. But when I just grab some things on mass and you know, you're trying to sample from an area that looks similar, obviously, but that's pretty easy to do. Even when you grab a lot of things with shift, Okay, and you gotta clean up your reflection too, keep that in mind, because it's gonna be the same thing. I often do blur my reflection a little bit. We could do that this time around, and that'll give us an easier time retouching, which is a funny motivation to blur the reflection to begin with, not the purest of motivations. And some of these things could have been prevented by cleaning, and some of them are actual reflections of weird stuff going on. Sometimes to do with the lighting, or sometimes just some internal reflection, right? Okay, and the ice cubes could definitely use a quick touch-up. 
won't go too nuts. All right. Some things are looking more distorted in a nice way and a little cleaner. And I will clean up the reflection, but why don't we do something fun with it? I'll go to filter, blur, and here's a fun blur you may not have used often, field blur. I'll delete the default one up there. And on this bottom one, I'll just give it a value of zero. So I'm pretty much telling it the horizon is zero. I'll make a pin down there and I'm going to do it more subtle than you want, but sometimes it ends up looking nuts if you go too heavy. Okay. That's reasonably subtle. I'll alt click the mask button to make it disappear. And I will just fade it in with a white gradient tool, just kind of down here at the bottom just because sometimes that tool softens up the things past the node for some reason. And I just want to make sure it's really only occurring down here, just a little kick a blur. But one thing I want to quickly show you while I still have time is I'm going to merge everything. So control J, control E, and then I'm going to grab a selection here. How should I do this? Yeah, I'll grab a marquee selection with 15 pixels of feather. And what I'm going to do, just because there's a white under light kind of happening here because of the way we lit it, I'm going to copy this one over and see if I prefer it at all. So I'll just grab all this down here and it's going to have a natural feather. Hit control J to duplicate that control T right click flip horizontal. And then if I hold shift, if the image is crazy straight, it should probably line up. But even if not, I'm going to try to again, use the up and down arrows to subtly place it in there. Actually, I think that's sitting right. And sometimes I'll leave that in or leave that out, but you can turn that on and off. And it's really obvious where the fake parts are once you do that. But you can ask yourself if you prefer any element of that. And if you do, Alt, click the mask, get out a white brush. And with full flow, full flow action, you can paint that in there. Or, you know, take a number of measures to make it more symmetrical. But that's like a subtle example of something you can do kind of quickly. Having the control at your fingertips to bring in a curves layer brightening it and again inverting the mask is you could bring out your gradient tool G and with a white radial gradient which is a nice tool you could fade that effect in you know the glowing parts of the glass if you want to add another kick of light you could also do that in the ice or as I said uh, like de-intensify any of these highlights if they're getting too wild for you the bottom's looking a lot cleaner now that we fixed up a few of those issues and added a blur oh yeah and I'm not crazy about this side highlight here but that is something in my original edit, I did displace from another shot. So that is another option you can bring in, just like we brought in the other side of our own glass a moment ago. The original tone also had a lot more blue in it, but that's something you can just manually remove with the hue saturation. But then sometimes you end up missing it because it looks kind of nice anyways. So it was fun recreating this lighting system here today. Leave me a comment if you have any questions. And thanks for watching another workflow video. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Make sure to join the Facebook group if you haven't. It's a great way to marinate in the education and accelerate everything. And I enjoy connecting with people there. And I will see you next time on Workflow. Ciao.